<laughs> Alright, so since this is my first video, I figured I should introduce myself. Um, I'm Michael, often known as Kaningo. I'm a ex-penetration tester for NCC Group. I'm a pretty successful bug bounty hunter in my own right. And these days, I'm the global head of security operations for Bug Crowd. Essentially, I manage the triage team and a few other different functions over there. Um, I also have written a number of open source tools, and the niche I'm trying to carve here is really deep diving tools that people have authored um, to encourage me to go deeper and to really look into those tools, but also to give me a platform to talk about them. So with this particular tutorial, I've really dug into FFUF, and I've done a really long written guide to go with this. And I really wanted to make the point up front here, there's a ton of other really good creators that I'm going to reference on the written guide and in the description of this video I recommend checking out. and. In addition to that, I really wanted to call out Insider PhD's video. She made this um, subject before I did, and she did a really good job of it. And I feel that even though uh, I'm recovering the subject, her video content made it better. We've gone in different directions, and watching both gives you the most well-rounded picture of FF. And then the other thing I wanted to call out, if you're new to all of this, and any of this looks daunting, I'm going to put some starting points in the written guide to help you kind of make your move and understand what you need before you come back to this video to know what FFUF is and how to go about it. So that'll be some reference on uh, knowledge of the terminal, Kali Linux and things like that. But this stuff isn't hard, it's just knowing the right pieces of knowledge before you get into this piece of knowledge and that's entirely accessible to you as well. So enjoy and uh, I'd love any feedback, good, bad or otherwise. Thank you. All right, FUF, what is it? So FUF is often described as a web directory brute forcer because that's what most people are using it for these days, but it's actually a whole lot more than that. Self-described, it's a fast web fuzzer written in Go, and the aim of this guide is to show you how that works. Essentially, you can fuzz any point of a request with FUF. You don't just have to brute force directories, you can brute force headers, you can use it for different activities such as looking for SQL injection, it'll XSS if you want to. It's really, really useful and it's got so many useful features that I don't think a lot of people are leveraging at the moment. And the goal I, I want to bring to the table with this video is more explanation and more visibility of those. It's an open source project, it's on GitHub, and it's maintained by Joey. He does a really good job of curating his community around this, keeping the project active and keeping it moving forward. So if you're a developer and you're watching this, it's a really good project to contribute to. If you're not and you're making use of it, it's a really good project to back and to sponsor as well. And so I hope you enjoy. And if you are a little bit more used to FR, feel free to skip through some of the intro content. We're going to start with an install and a few other things. But if you're not, then hopefully that'll help you get started as well. So let's get started. Let's do an install. There's a couple of ways you can install FUF these days. It's pretty varied and you'll find more methods not covered here in the written companion guide to this video. But the two that I most like is to install from Go and to install from the Kali app repositories. So the first one is the Kali app repositories. If you go through apt, so you go sudo apt install FUF, it's going to go to the Kali repositories, get the latest version that's hosted there and put it on your system. And in this case, we can see that that is version whoa, 102, right? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the latest version. And if we want to always get the latest version, the best way to do that is to build from source. To do that, we need to go via Go. So if you haven't installed Go on your system before, then you need to first do that and then come back to this step. The method to do, of doing that is to go go get github.com slash ffuff slash ffuff. This is how you install a Go binary on any system that's hosted on GitHub. So after doing that, it's going to go to GitHub, go to the main branch, get the latest code, compile it and put it in our Go bin. So if we go to the Go bin and run the version there, you'll see this version is 1.2.0. Now remembering before, we were on version 1.0.2. So this is a much later build. And this may not be as stable. I, I don't tend to put go bin in my path so that I can use this version typically. So I'll go go bin ffuff and do everything I want to do. But then if there's an error with that, I can come back to the latest version in the apt repositories and use it directly. So I have an older, more stable version in my system as well as the cutting edge version in my system, allowing me a lot of flexibility in my workflow. So if something's wrong with the latest version, I don't lose any time. I just cut back, lose the last stable, and I may not have all the features at my, at my disposal, but I do have the flexibility of not having to stop, 
diagnose and I can just come back to it later. If you do use the Go version, then you're also going to want to upgrade it quite regularly. And to do that, you do the same as before, except you put a negative U in front of it. That's going to go to GitHub again, get the latest version and rebuild it for you. All right, let's have some fun with this. We'll do our first scan. Now, Effa finds endpoints using word lists and a word list is essentially just a text file or a file of some sort with words on separated lines. So in this case, I've got three lines, admin, test, and test one, two, three as my word list. And I want, I want to run that against my asset. So I can go ff negative u being the URL I want to target, https kodinga.io, and I put this fuzz keyword where I want the wordless entries to be. So as this runs, it's going to use each item from the word list and replace it with fuzz. And I specify my word list. So now when I run that, it's going through and it's replacing the fuzz keyword here with each item from the word list and checking the response type. And so there's a whole variety of HTTP response types and some of them we want to look at a bit further. So 301s and 200 responses. So you can see here, it says there's something at admin. So if we were to curl that and then have a look, we'll be able to see, you know, out of our results that we had, there's something there and we've found an asset. So the main trick to all of this is selecting the right word list. If you have a better word list than someone else, you're going to find different content. Now, starting out, the best place to start without question is Seclis. Seclis is a project maintained by Daniel Meisler, Jason Haddix, and Gottmilk. It's a community run project and it gets stuff from all over the internet and has word lists for a whole variety of needs. As you move beyond that, there's a really great talk from Namaseccon by Tom Nom Nom. He did a talk on how to build your own word lists and all the mechanics that go into that. And I really recommend that as well. Both of those resources can be found in the description below. So, recursion. Recursion is basically doing the same action again. If you Google recursion, jokingly, it'll tell you, see, recursion. In this case, it means when we find a directory, let's run the same word list that we passed it before over that directory to see if there's anything else underneath it. It's really, really useful when you're working on a large asset and you discover 30 directories and you want to run it again. It's inefficient to go and re-specify FUF for every single one of those directories. There's two flags in FUF. There's recursion and recursion depth. Recursion depth basically means how many times will I perform recursion and recursion says we're going to do recursion here. Okay, so to perform recursion, I've added an extra item to our word list panel. I recommend you do the same if you want to follow the exercise exactly. After we've done that, we're going to say ff negative u. I'm going to say kodinga.io word slash fuzz, same as before. Notice that we don't have the appending slash this time. When you perform recursion with ff, you can't have anything appending to the end. After we've done that, we're going to say our word list. But this time, we're going to specify the recursion flag. So we run that. You'll see it's going through. It's performing the same action it did before. And when the results come back, you'll see that it found both the admin directory and it also found panel underneath it. So we can see here all of the job output. So it first found admin and then it's added the new queue under admin. And when it did that, it found panel. So we've got Kodingo to io slash panel and by default it'll keep performing this we didn't add a recursion depth of one if we did it would have stopped at that point because we didn't it then went and found admin panel and it tried to fuzz it again now there's not anything additional under that so it didn't pick it up but there could be another really important feature that we should be aware of is the ability to specify extensions to add to our word list scan Essentially, it's just going to add whatever we specify as an extension onto the end of our word list and scan for that. So let's think about this. You're a software developer, you haven't done a very good job of curating a version management system, and you've just thrown a backup file on there, right? So maybe you've just taken a web file and you put dot .back. That's really useful as someone in security to identify. So to look for that kind of thing, we go ff negative u, can you go to io forward slash fuzz, same as before. We'll specify our word list and we'll specify recursion. 
but this time we're going to add .bac under the extension flag. And notice we put the dot there. Because this is just tacking onto the end of our word list, if we didn't put the dot, then it wouldn't necessarily find what we want it to find. It's important to note that because not all file names are going to have a dot. You might want to search for a file with an underscore at the end or underscore version, things like that. Really good art to get into of finding different ways you can fuzz for extensions. After we run it, same as before, it's going to do our recursive scan, except it's doing the word list this time with .bac on the end. And so it's going through, looking for our hits, and then you can see here, it's found .back files in our in essentially our local our remote instance. So with that, we can now go and explore those files with curl, or we can download them. We can look, and we can see, you know, is there something useful in here? It could be that you know there was an index.php, but then there's an index.bat. So now we can see the source code behind that site. A whole range of useful use cases, and definitely something you want to be checking for. So it's also important to note, you can specify different fuzz words other than fuzz, but you can't use that with recursion. So as useful as recursion is, at the moment with FF, you can't go to that level, which is okay and doesn't limit us too much. It'll limit us a little bit with pitchfork based attacks, which we'll talk about later in this guide, but that's still acceptable because we can always use uh, cluster bomb and it just means more requests. So if we run out scan again you can see I have a colon after my word list and I specified w1 here and then instead of fuzz I have w1 so that's essentially saying instead of the fuzz keyword we're going to use w1 and that's going to come up in a few different use cases especially as we get into request importing as well so this is a really important thing to take note of even though in a lot of more generic directory brute forcing you won't use it as we get into more specific fuzz cases for ff um, such as vho scanning and things like that we're going to want to specify these and so if we run this, note that the results are going to be a little different because we're no longer doing recursion. But in large part, you can see if you wanted to do your own comparison running this with and without the W1, the results are going to be the same. There's a number of tricks you can do and a few different ways you can consume the data from FF, and I'm going to cover a few of those. The one that I find the most useful is to pass the silent mode to, to FF, and that'll basically tell FF, don't print all of the buffer, just print my results. Right? And then that'll come back, it'll do its thing, and it'll just populate whatever returns from your matches and doesn't hit your filters. Once you have that data, you need to consume it somehow. So this is great, but it's just in the terminal. You could pipe it to another tool, but I personally like to use T. So what T will do is stream the results to the console whilst writing out to a file. So I'll say out file.txt and it's going to print in the terminal as my um, FF returns results, but it'll also stream it out to the file, which is really useful if you're going to consume it in a variety of fashions. So you can see that streamed out. I get it out of order, but that's okay. It's still going to be the most useful data for me. I can now go and see the results in my out file. So in addition to silent mode, there's also a number of other ways to make data easy to consume from FF. HTML is a good example. So with FF, there's two flags that we can use. There's the of, and this has a variety of formats, and I recommend looking into the documentation for that. And then there's also o. So o, o specifies the output file. And in this case, I'm saying I want to run the same job that I did before, show me the results in the terminal, but write me an output HTML file titled Kiringo. And that'll run, it'll process, and then after that, it'll give me a HTML report that I can consume as I need to, essentially allowing me to quickly look at my results. Personally speaking, I don't find this very useful for large result sets, it's a little difficult to consume. But for smaller result sets or inclusion on a pen test report, it's a really useful feature. It's going to allow you to quickly spit out a table, take the results and place them wherever else you need to. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that throughout the course to date, we've used the default filter and the default matching items in FF. We're essentially saying, hey, run me a scan, just do the defaults that you think are recommended. But it's really important that you learn and understand those. So going through the written guide associated with this, there's a lot of information there. And also as we get further into this course, we'll cover the auto calibration options, which are very useful. 
but in large part you should take some time go through help in FFuff and read all of the documentation that's within it as well. This video will date over time, there's going to be new options and new filters that come out. But it's also going to allow you to get the most out of the tool, knowing how to configure, how to tweak your scans, not just relying on the auto calibration and other features within it. And that's going to make you a much better tester overall. Now that said, the ones I think you should start with, you're going to want to come to match your options here. So, Understanding HTTP status codes, you can see the defaults that are enabled. However, often that's going to need some tweaking. There could be a, a web application that responds to everything with a 200 or everything with a 301 and understanding why and how to filter that out. You can also do regular expression matching. So you could look for specific terms on specific pages in response to your fuzzing activity. And you can also use filters to say, look, you know, every, every page is responding with a 200 request, but it's got some known quantities around it. So I'm going to get rid of that. So I can say filter, regular expression. That could also be useful for 404s to filter the known 404 page and find ones that may have different elements on them. Ultimately, going over this and playing around with it is the best way to learn it. And I tried very hard to make some key examples, but it really is something that you need to explore in depth and spend your time learning to really become a master of this tool. So sooner or later, you're going to come across a situation where you are authenticated and you need to fuzz beyond the perimeter of that website. Now, assuming that's cookie-based authentication, I've provided an example here of what that would look like, assuming that Kiningo.io was authenticated. After the string that we passed before, you'll see there's negative B and there's two cookie values there, name one and its value and name two and its value. And let's just assume that I watched the flow in burp I captured the cookie string there, or I may have watched it in Chrome. And then I've reproduced it in here so that FFuff can use that same cookie and authentic. In this example, however, let's assume that we need some custom headers. So I've specified that as well. In this case, it's negative H. And in both of these cases, negative B and negative H, so cookies or headers, you can also pass multiple flags. So you could say negative H, here's my headers run your request, realize you need more, and just tack it onto the end of your command as you go. So it's quite useful to expand upon that. And FFuff does support that with things like word list as well, and a whole other range of parameters. So often you can just add onto your command and build it as you go. Occasionally, however, you're going to hit some authentication that you're not going to be able to do with just passing headers or cookies. It gets a little bit more complicated. And the best way to handle this with not just FFuff, but any tool is to just have Burp handle it for you. Now, bearing in mind that Burp Suite projects don't work very well if they get too large, so you will want to use a temporary project for this. But if you come into Burp Suite, you go to the proxy tab and the options tab. You'll see there's these proxy listeners. This is how you communicate with Burp via Chrome or Firefox. You bind to port 8080, but you can actually add more of them. So you can say port 4444 and request handling. We could say redirect to Kaninga.io on port 443. So when we create this, if we were in FFuff to target 127.001.4444, it'll automatically stream the request to Kadinga.io, but it's going via Burp Suite. So it'll use Burp Suite's cookie jar, it'll capture in the proxy history. You could use a Burp Suite macro with it if you were doing some more fancy testing. So at the end of the day, you get all of the flexibility of Burp. However, it's within FFuff that you can consume it. So for this example, I've built a new file. You'll see I've got a file called domains now. It's got Kaningo and test in it. If you look at the new FFuff command, I've got, I've got two fuzzing locations here, W2 and W1. W1 is powered by the word list we've been using throughout the course. And W2 is powered by the new domains file that we've built. You can specify as many of these as you want, and you can build out as many fuzzing locations as you want. But the power of this scan is that it's taking our word list and it's applying it over multiple domains. It's going to test test.io and kadingo.io. So if you had some sort of vulnerability and you had a, a reasonably wide scope you wanted to test it over, this is a great way to do it. You can specify all of the items and essentially run them at will. And you can see in the results here, when it used Kaningo and admin, it got a response. When it used test and admin, it didn't. 
So we can see here that using this word list over multiple domains allowed us to do a test that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do without wrapping into parallels or interlace or some sort of bash loop. So as wonderful as we've seen FFB in the terminal, you also can import requests and do some editing and set fuzz points that way. It's not always ideal to specify everything in a single command, sometimes you just want to import some functionality. So in Burp Suite, or whatever proxy you're using, let's assume that you've captured the request to kidingo.io, the one when we land on the front page. That's pretty easy. You just come in proxy, turn it on, and you'll see it there. If you're unfamiliar with this, I recommend playing around with Burp Suite and looking around YouTube for some other guides. There's some great ones. After you've done that, come into Burp Suite and right click on the request. There's two options here that look like they could do what we're asking. There's save item and there's copy to file. Save item isn't going to give us the format we need, but copy to file takes the raw data here and puts it in a file. So we'll just save that in our temp directory as request. So now we have our request, we need to set a fuzzing point or points. In this case, we're going to set one. So we go vim temp request, and we're going to assume that we're directory brute forcing. So at the end of the slash here, let's set the word fuzz. After we've done that, we can run ff with the request flag. So we go ff negative request dot sl uh, slash temp slash request. We still set our word list and we can run it. We don't need to set a u or a URL point because we're using that in the request. So you can see the URL has been populated here exactly the same as it was before, except now it's powered by our request and it's found our admin panel just like it did previously. So we've covered a few really interesting things and we can tie them together. We've covered word lists and setting multiple fuzzing points, importing requests, and we've also touched on different things in word lists. So one of those is different modes. By default, FF runs in what's called cluster bomb mode. That means for each word list that you passed it, it'll try every possible permutation. But what happens if you're in a scenario where you've been given a users.txt file and a passwords.txt file, and the two correspond to each other. So you have Kaningo matching the password hunter2 and the user anonymous matching the password password. In the default configuration of FOF, that means that we're going to generate all of the requests you see above. It essentially FOF is going to try Kaningo, the username, with both passwords instead of just the one that corresponds to it. And that's not ideal for this use case because with two very large word lists, that's going to exceed the number of requests that we want to send to the server. We'd much rather send a smaller list. And that's where pitchfork mode comes in. Pitchfork mode is going to send only two requests. It's going to say the user Kidingo matches to Hunter2, the user Anonymous matches to Password. And it knows what matches simply based by what line item it's on. So the first line item matches with the first line item on the secondary word list and so on and so forth. And ultimately for these kind of use cases, that's really powerful because it means instead of potentially sending 100, 200, 300 requests we don't want, we're just sending what's necessary for the testing that we're performing. Another useful trick to know about when you're trying to slow down requests is knowing when to stop. And this is where stop on spurious errors comes in. So this flag is SE. If the last 50 requests have thrown a response code, typically a 403, 95% of the time, or if 20% of the responses have been a 429 response code, then it's going to seize the job. Pentester, bug bounty, or researcher, you're going to need to slow your request down, at least sometimes. FF runs extremely quickly and it opens a lot of requests very rapidly. And you can control that to a degree with the threads flag. You could drop your threads to one and really limit how fast it was running. But that's not ideal and it's not really measurable. You might be given some terms for testing that are a bit more restrictive than that. With that, there's the P flag. That allows you to specify how many seconds between requests and it manages this over a thread pool as well. Likewise, you can limit the maximum requests a second. So if you said 10 requests a second, again, it's going to manage it across the thread pool and make sure that it's adhering to those responses. It's really useful to control how fast you're scanning and you can slow this down on an asset that becomes unresponsive when you hit it too quickly, or you can set this to meet engagement demands. Two of my favorite features that make FF really useful to me are AC and ACC. AC is automatic calibrate filtering. Basically, what it's doing is sending a series of pre-flight checks, 
baselining those requests and on your future requests it's using them to filter out noise so you don't have to tweak your filters and matches to the same degree. Likewise a CC is used instead of AC but it will send a preflight request of your choosing. So for example if you're looking for a virtual host you might benchmark the request that you have for www and then it'll only surface to you hits that push against that or you might benchmark a negative result intentionally to make sure that you're only filtering items that are far drifted from that to only see your successful hits. Earlier in this guide we showed you how you could use a second interface in Burp Suite and send all of your requests through a Burp Suite configuration. If you want to do that but you only want to send successful requests, FFUF has a really neat feature called Replay Proxy. Now it's worth noting that that's going to hit the target twice, once when it runs on FFUF and run once when it runs through Burp, because Burp's going to repeat the request. To do that, we use Replay Proxy and our proxy. Since we're using Burp Suite on port 8080, we're going to specify that. It's going to run, analyze the results, and then for these successful responses that match our matches and don't match our filters, it will send it over to Burp Suite. Now that this is completed, we can come over to Burp Suite and we can see the requests that were successful. FF only had one that matched our matches and didn't hit our filters, which was admin, and you can see it shows up in the proxy history. Where this gets really cool is if you want to use a remote VPS, but you want to have your successful request replay in your local Burp instance so you can explore things further. And to do that, we can use a reverse SSH tunnel. So we're going to SSH into a machine that I've put in my HC host as FF, mostly because I don't want to disclose on a video what the IP address of that is. I've set the port 8888. Now this is the port on the remote VPS. So the remote VPS is going to bind the port 8888 and that's going to relay to our local host on port 8080, which is burp. So anything we target on port 8888 on our instance is going to relay back through port 8080 locally. So if we connect. So here's my FUF command. I'm not putting FUF in my go bin on this server, so I don't have that. I'm targeting it as we covered early in the, in the tutorial. I'm doing the same fuzzing location, I've got a word list, and I'm replaying my proxy over port 8888, because if you remember, that's the port that's got the reverse SSH tunnel on it. I run it, and when it's successful, then we should see that come back to our local burp instance for any requests that were successfully sent over. Remembering again, they're going to replay, so it's going to send out from your VPS, and then it's going to replay locally. You could avoid that by having burp intercept on, however, you may not want to do that. It depends on the testing that you're undertaking. And when we come back to our local burp suite, you'll see we've got the requests here as well. And just a reminder, these did send outwards also. Because we didn't have intercept on, they've gone straight to our HTTP history, and it does essentially do exactly what it says on the tin. It's a replay proxy. It's not just putting it in your burp suite project without sending it again. It is going to send from your IP and your VPS's IP. So if you are doing some fuzzing and you may be up against Cloudflare or Akamai, you probably don't want to do that locally. You want to contain that to your VPS so you don't get a local Akamai ban. So use this feature within reason, but it is a very useful thing to have in the toolkit. So in closing, thank you if you made it this far. I really want to point out that the written guide here is open source. You can find it on GitHub. And as this changes over time, I'll aim to keep it as up to date as I can. If there's mistakes in this video, feel free to contribute them there. It's a really good way of giving people the most up to date and canonical reference that we can. And on the whole, just thank you. I really enjoyed making this and I hope you enjoyed watching it.